Now, I want to talk about Mahatma Gandhi. That's the section we're looking at now. And uh, just a bit ago, I talked about Ahimsa being a very important theme in his thinking. So we continue now from that discussion about Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi, beginning first of all with his uh, significant, with the significant way in which he was influenced by Ahimsa. Um, Mahatma Gandhi was also very influenced by uh, Tolstoy, Tolstoy, uh, the philosopher who called for a his look at history which would uh, be committed to, uh, to uh, nonviolence, to justice with nonviolence. Tolstoy was calling for a world which would lay aside wars and all of that sort of thing. That was also a very important theme within Gandhi's thinking as he pressed forward for India to become independent of the British Empire. Um, another source of his inspiration in his philosophical development was the Bible, particularly Jesus Christ. Uh, he was very clear that Jesus, and especially his teachings uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, about how to deal with the enemy, turn the other cheek, uh, nonviolent resistance to evil, those sorts of themes, uh, he was very indebted to Jesus Christ for, for that, that uh, value, that commitment that he held so deeply in his struggle against the injustices of the British uh, imperial system. And so there's a variety of, of influences that, that, that converged within Mahatma Gandhi. One, as we said, was Ahimsa, uh, non, uh, the, non, uh, uh, the sacredness of all of life. And the other was Tolstoy. And of course, as we said, Jesus. Um, Mahatma Gandhi was therefore very informed uh, by the Christian faith, but he had some deep problems also with the Christian faith. For example, um, Mahatma Gandhi was never happy about the church because the church was an inter-caste community. And Mahatma Gandhi believed that the best way to form a pluralistic society in India is the caste system. He thought that is good. Well, church goes against the caste system because persons in the church are all part of a new community, which is an inter-caste community. That troubled Gandhi a lot. He wanted to transform the evils in the caste system, and uh, he worked energetically at that, but he never imagined a pluralist society that was not grounded in the caste system. That's how he thought it should be put together. So that was an area of concern for him. Another area of concern for him in regards to the church was, uh, was the way in which the church uh, seemed to neglect the teachings of Jesus, particularly the ethics of Jesus. As I said earlier, Mahatma Gandhi believed very deeply that the teachings of Jesus on how to relate to the enemy and oppression is very helpful and necessary as he pressed forward to bring about independence of, of uh, India from the, from the British Empire. But he felt that the church said, well, Jesus is wonderful, but his ethics are too idealistic. We really can't apply these ethics of love for the enemy in, a, in the real world in which we live. Uh, and then the church would say, well, but Mahatma Gandhi, maybe you should take this teachings of Jesus as metaphorical, not really serious. And he would say, when you say that, you are abandoning the essence of the Christian faith. Jesus never anticipated that we will take his, his teachings metaphorically. He means for us literally to love the enemy and to work for justice in a way that confronts the enemy, but in a way that respects the enemy and certainly in an unviolent way. And so that's one reason Gandhi determined decided, as he explains it, not to become a Christian. Because he said the Christians have too often betrayed the Christian faith. And so uh, he sought to practice the ethics of Jesus and he lectured Christians around the world, particularly in England and in India, to embrace the teachings and ethics of Jesus. But he himself said, if I were to call myself a Christian, then it would seem to me that I would be coming complicit uh, I would be agreeing with you in your ways of sort of avoiding the ethics of Jesus. So here is this Hindu uh, pusher uh, uh, leader who is pressing for an independent India. 
using the ethics of Jesus as a foundational commitment in his struggle against the British Empire uh, and lecturing the church to take Jesus seriously, particularly his teachings. The other area that troubled Gandhi was the Christian teaching about forgiveness. And we've already referred to that a bit. Uh, we will again when we look at Buddhism. Uh, but uh, Gandhi believed that the Christian theology of forgiveness undercuts uh, a commitment to morality. In other words, he believed that when you believe really in the law of karma, that your deeds would determine your fate and there's no forgiveness, no deviation from that. If you believe that, then you will be a righteous person. You won't compromise righteous living. But if you believe that forgiveness is easily received, then that will undercut the foundations of morality. And uh, he felt that Christians uh, too quickly would go to church, take the communion and the, and the mass, accept that they are forgiven, and then go out and continue sinning as they had before. And that disturbed him very deeply. And that is one reason he, uh, he uh, confronted Christians in their doctrine of forgiveness. That was a concern of his. And uh, Gandhi also was uh, very concerned about the Christian confession that Jesus is Lord. Remember again the Bhagavad Gita? There's 50 million gods in Hinduism. And Gandhi would say, yes, believe in Jesus, no problem at all. But when you say Jesus is the only Lord and Savior, that gave him great trouble, uh, Gandhi, in his interaction with Christians. He resisted that kind of theology very strongly. And uh, for himself, he, had, um, he was committed to, um, he said he'll just be committed to all the gods uh, because uh, he believed, again, that's the best way to put a, a pluralistic religious system together. So those are some of the themes that went into forming Gandhi in his, in his uh, uh, pressing forward to uh, bring about um, a, a um, independence for, uh, for um, um, India from the, British, from the British Empire. Now, <clears throat> the great test for Gandhi's leadership as the British Empire began to crumble under this, uh, this confrontation at many different levels of nonviolent resistance to the empire, and it was beginning to crumble. His great challenge was Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Muhammad Ali Jinnah was a leader of the Muslims in, in India. And um, Jinnah believed that the Muslims should develop their own political state independent of India. At that time, Pakistan, both um, East and West Pakistan were part of India, and India is predominantly Hindu. And so uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was pressing forward, insisting that when independence comes for India, Pakistan will separate from India and establish its own Muslim state. Pakistan meaning the land of the pure. This will be a pure, wonderful Islam that will govern uh, uh, Pakistan. When, in saying that, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was communicating a pretty basic Muslim yearning, hope, quest, for the Muslim community to become the Dar al Salam. the region under Muslim political authority. That's a deep yearning for Muslims in many parts of the world. And as they were moving toward independence, the Muslims said, look, we don't want to be governed by a society which has 500 million gods. There's only one God, Allah. We need to form our own independent state which is grounded in the truth that there's no God but Allah not this Hindu polytheism. Gandhi worried about that immensely, for Gandhi's vision was a pluralist India in which Sikhs and Jains and Christians and Muslims and Hindus and all the castes of Hinduism, the 50,000 castes um, and the Sikhs and, and all of these communities, the Ahmadiyya, all of them would be included within a pluralistic India. Um, and the Muslims under Muhammad Ali Jinnah's leadership says, no, 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 we can't, we can't, we can't accept that. 
and it, it became extremely conflictual. Gandhi, in fact, fasted well nigh unto death to attempt to uh, be a voice of conscience within, within India, both to Hindus and to Muslims, that they should live together as brothers and not feel this push for uh, political control. But it didn't work. In this, Gandhi's vision did not work out. And in 1947-48, as India moves towards independence, Pakistan moved away. And 10 million Pakistanis and Hindus were displaced in that enormous um, exchange of people, with millions and millions of Hindus in Pakistan coming south to get away from this developing Muslim state, and millions and millions of, Hind of, of Muslims going north from India into Pakistan to establish their land of the pure. So those who would say that religion has very little relevance to modern issues, here is an example of a profoundly religious conflict uh, which led to enormous disruption as the Muslims established their independent state and the Hindus their state. As India moved toward independence, there was also another enormous struggle as to, as to um, uh, whether India will become a secular state or be a Hindu state, and which of those voices finally prevailed. Do you know? It was the secular state voices that prevailed. So India became not a Hindu state, but a secular state. In contrast, Pakistan became a Muslim state. It was the Christians in India, they were a minority, but an influential minority. It was the Christians in India that especially pushed for India to become a secular state, a pluralist secular state, not Hindu. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi was recognized as someone with a great soul, Satyagraha means great soul. That is a Hindu or a Jain understanding of someone who has the capacity to forgive generously and not bitter, not permit bitterness to infect his attitude towards his enemies. That was Mahatma Gandhi. But in the midst of all that he experienced at the hands of the British, um, his great soul um, gave him an authority to speak to the issues and to lead the, the country forward in ways which were just simply remarkable. Now that great soul gift by Gandhi has continued to be a, an encouragement to peacemakers around the world to this very day. Wherever you travel around the world today and you meet areas where there is conflict having to do with injustices and so forth, and you find that people are marshalling their resources to confront these injustices in a peaceful, nonviolent way. Uh, in various ways, I think such movements are almost always, to some extent, influenced by Mahatma Gandhi. I mentioned South Africa here the other day, and the movement in South Africa towards developing the peace uh, in a situation of great difficulty and great challenge. And Desmond Tutu, the bishop of the Anglican Church in South Africa, giving leadership to those peace efforts, working nonviolently to bring about change in South Africa. Very much of what he was about was influenced by Mahatma Gandhi. Also very much by Jesus Christ, all of these peace movements, you know, who called, taught us to love our enemies. That salt, that leaven, uh, which the Christian faith puts in societies around the world of a commitment to love even the enemy, is a very significant influence in helping to encourage nonviolent approaches to peacemaking. But I say Mahatma Gandhi in a very special way embodied that in his struggle in India 
and has been an influential figure in peace movements around the world, although he lived some 60, 70 years ago uh, when he was, uh, that he, he's, his legacy lives on as a man committed to peacemaking and who drew into that peacemaking movement various streams of commitment and philosophies and theologies.